So. Mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm privileged. Uh, I'm honored to be here at uh, the Children's Nationals. So I bring greetings from India. I bring greetings from the state of Uttar Pradesh that actually also happens to be at the epicenter of public health challenges in the country. In fact, majority of you here would have uh, would know about the whole commitment, the global commitment towards meeting Millennium Development Goals. In fact, if India does not meet its Millennium Development obligations and commitment, the global community will not be able to meet it. The same condition actually applies for the state of Uttar Pradesh in India, which actually accounts for a quarter of the population of India, which in its own measure, it's huge. So I will essentially use this opportunity to talk to you about an experience that we began in 2003. It was a social experiment that we started while I was at Hopkins with another colleague of mine, Gary Darmstadt, and many of you might be knowing him. So we both started this, this social experiment in the year 2003. And so I'll take you through the story. And I'd also like to be excused because it seems on my way, I got sick. So I might just uh, be, uh, you know, take a sip or two as we continue. So I beg your forgiveness for it. Thank you very much for coming. I'll keep to your time. I'll spend 30 minutes in describing uh, the study, and then we'll take questions at the end of it. Thank you very much. So just quickly, we uh, it's about community empowerment saves newborn lives. And this is very different from many of you who work in a highly specialized center as this hospital. So we set up what we call it as a community empowerment lab. Bring the best in science, uh, merge it with the best the community has to offer, and then test those models and see if it has something for the rest of the world. So the context is extremely important. The context is about where newborns die in the world. And so I've essentially put the slide into four. And this, I like to transport you to the context where these babies are dying. At this moment, over three million babies die before the age of one month, and most of them die actually in the developing world. 25% of those babies who die in the world actually die in India, and out of which 25% actually die in the state of Uttar Pradesh. So this is where, uh, this is the map of India with the blue states and the red states. And so the red ones are the ones that actually contribute to over 60% of India's neonatal death burden. And so if we had to reach the Millennium Development Goals, it was extremely important that we are able to tackle the challenges of newborn mortality in these settings. These settings are, are also important because if you actually look at these red states, compared it to the green states, for example, the also represent not just a vast difference in the same country of the mortality burden, but it also is symptomatic of the deeper systemic problems and challenges. So they have extremely weak public health delivery system. When we started this in the year 2003, only 10% of babies were being born in the hospital, delivered by train medical health professionals. 90% of those actually were being born in the home in the absence of any kind of skilled medical care. Most of the planning in the country in India has been very top down. And so there's been all the majority of those births and deaths are taking place in the home, in the communities. The appreciation of the policymakers and the program managers of the context within which the children are born and die, they're actually very limited. And therefore, majority of them 
majority of the programs that are developed, they do not recognize the significance of community linkages. And therefore, not surprisingly, the, these states also contribute to the majority of deaths happening in these regions. So when we looked at these deaths, we realized that majority of those deaths are actually happening right in the first week. Now, this data also contributes to, many of you must have read the Lancet series on where all these neonatal deaths are taking place. And so this is very similar to the distribution of deaths by day across the developing world. And this data comes from Shivgar, uh, this, the, the district where we actually did the study. We looked further and then we realized that this is, uh, this was also the first seven days was also the duration was also the, this seven days was the timing where babies were confined within the household. So I'll tell you more about that in, in the slides. So these were, so just to kind of give you further on this, the service coverage across the continuum was extremely low in this period. So majority of these deaths were taking place in the first seven days, but less than 10% of these households were actually visited by a frontline health worker. They were, and, and in fact, lower or non-existent during most of these critical period. So there was actually very high awareness for some of the key practices, but then there was limited behavior change. So we looked at it further and said, yes, we did a verbal autopsy of it and looked at the neonatal deaths that had taken place in the past two years, and then did a cause of death through a verbal autopsy. We mapped it against the data set that comes from the global database of neonatal deaths. And we realized that the majority of deaths in high mortality region, where we have greater than 45 newborn deaths taking place for every thousand, majority of those babies are dying of infection. As you move, for example, from the state of these red states to the green states, majority of those deaths are then contributed more by birth asphyxia and not by infection. So there was a need, we felt that there was, a, opportunity, there was a possibility that we could actually do some prevention management here. Now, and that's where we felt that there was one area that we did not have much evidence of at least in the community setting, was hypothermia. And so we tried to look at and expand on the epidemiology of hypothermia in community settings. So, so we looked at some of the other models. Uh, and at that point in time, there were two. One was a large programmatic model that was available in the country. And there was another research model that was available in the country. The programmatic model was actually based on illness recognition at the community level by a community health worker, and then working to get them to seek care appropriately and have them uh, service being provided by a healthcare provider. And the second was a very seminal work that was done by Abe Bang, who essentially said, can we train health workers to identify babies with infection or with signs of infection and essentially provide antibiotics treatment right at the home? He was able to demonstrate 70% reduction in neonatal mortality rate. And this was done uh, in, in the Western part of the country. So with this context for us, we knew that you could actually reduce neonatal mortality by an active case management. But for a country with very weak public health system, where even the uptake of essential newborn care or even breastfeeding was less than 10%, we needed a shift in the way we wanted to approach neonatal mortality reduction. And so we set up a site 
in Shivgar, it's a high mortality region. Over 90% of babies were being born in the home with very limited care seeking. The neonatal mortality rate at the inception of the study and through the period of the study was 82 per 1,000 live births. So this is an unacceptable figure by any standards. One of the reasons we chose Shivgar was we wanted a population that was representative of the larger population of the red states of the country. And so, so we picked up Shivgar essentially for that reason, because we could test a model, and if that model worked or did not work, those results could be generalizable to the larger population. We set up a collaboration, and that's where, on my way uh, to the talk, I was talking to Dr. Nalini Singh, and he said one of the core foundations of the success that we received was global collaboration. This was a collaboration between uh, the community of Shivgar, between the local institutions in India, and global institutions like Johns Hopkins University. So, and one of the reasons I also bring it here is global health has been in the past several years, and thanks to the generosity of Bill and Melinda Gates, we have seen a, a surge in interest in global health. And so as I speak, I also would like to invite and we'd be very open to collaborations for many different kinds because we believe these problems cannot be solved alone and it needs a meaningful partnership to do that. We set up a cohort there of 106,000 people to begin with, which should give us approximately 3,000 births every year. That was the numbers that we needed to recruit for 18 months to be able to see a difference. So we set up a surveillance site. We mapped every village. We mapped every individual, gave them a unique ID so that we could begin the trial. Before we started the intervention, we said it was very important for us to not to just take our learning that we had acquired as part of our medical training or public health training and then just take them there. It was extremely critical for us that we shift our paradigm towards trying to not see the community as a last mile that we wanted to reach or some solution that we had that we wanted to transfer. But it was important for us that we take pause, step back, and see if we could actually dive into the community and learn for ourselves without, with an open mind, just to understand what they do, why do they do. And so that's precisely what we did. And we felt that this formative research, this formative phase of trying to understand the community, trying to understand their practices, trying to understand how they reason was the most critical part of our entire social experiment and the learnings that we had. So we, in fact, in one of in my TED talk, we, I said before we actually began, the community was like a large, was an ocean that was intimidating. But once, and we were like the amateur scuba driver, divers who had never actually experienced what life was beneath those. But once we did, the story was very fascinating, and that's the story that I want to share today. We, we looked at, so here, you know, through the study, one key element of this entire experiment was trying to look at solutions at the confluence of science and local wisdom. We were wearing two hats and trying to integrate both of them at every possible junction. So we put, the, put down on our epidemiological hat and said, let's look at what the burden of disease is, what the mortality rate was, and what could be the potential causes. We further went and tried to see if even hypothermia was even a problem in this region. We actually realized that babies were even at risk of hypothermia even where the ambient temperature was over 40 degrees Celsius. 
And so what it meant was that hypothermia was the problem and the babies were at risk throughout the year. We, we looked at this and then we mapped some of the community practices against the neonatal mortality. So these bars that you see are essentially the daily risk of death for 1,000 survivors. So day one, the risk of death is very high, and it, then it tails off, and most of those deaths happen in the first week. And we said, let's look at key practices in the community, and let's map it against them. We looked at, and we realized that the babies actually, when they are born, they're actually, most of the babies, as I said, were born in the homes. Most of them by unskilled women. The babies were directly delivered onto the ground. Most of the cases were mud floors. The babies were delivered on the ground. They were, they were not white. So in over 80%, the babies were not white at all. So we go further and realize they lie uncovered for greater than 60 minutes until the cord is cut. We move further, and then almost most of these babies are bathed and scrubbed within 24 hours. And I'll come to that later and explain that. And they are bathed three to four times in the first week. Most of the babies, almost universally, every baby is massaged with mustard oil and, and it's scrubbed and massaged and uncovered. And almost 80% of the babies are given some kind of a pre-lacteal feed and over the majority are not breastfed within the first hour. So, so if you look at these practices purely from a biomedical perspective, and they sound bizarre, they impose incredible risk for survival in the babies. And, and so that's where we, now uh, let's look at, so we map the babies and so if we could introduce skin to skin care and see if the babies could actually, if, was it acceptable and did it bring a difference? So these are just from, now, now these are examples that you see, they are bizarre by any standards. So here, most of the babies were born on the floor. They were bathed, they were scrubbed, and, and there was, and most of the babies were uh, at risk of developing hypothermia. We look further, if you actually look at these practices, they, all of them happened within the first week. And this is the first week when we look at the people, at the key people who actually were championing these practices, we realize that there is a task-based role that was entrenched and traditionally followed for thousands of years. So we had, so during the first week, there is a woman who is from the lowest caste, who is known as a dolman. She usually is from the untouchable caste, who actually comes in and who is called in when the baby is born. And she comes here to clean the baby. It's because the baby is actually thought to be within the nine months of pregnancy is considered to be nine months of amenorrhea, which is nine months of accumulation of dirt. And so the baby, when it is born, it is perceived to be polluted. And therefore, a woman needs to be brought in to clean the baby, because actually somebody has to be more unclean than the pollutant itself to be cleaning. So it is the woman who's mostly untouchable from the lowest caste who's brought in, who scrubs the baby, removes the vernix. She takes clay from the pond. She 
She bathes the baby, massages the baby, removes the vernix, and then the baby is fed goat's milk. She is fed milk with a cotton wick for the first three days, and then the baby is put to the mother's breast. There's another woman who comes in slightly above the higher, on a caste hierarchy, slightly higher above the domain is the noun. She's the village masi. She comes in and her job is to massage the baby for the first month. She uses mustard oil, which we now find that it has potentially toxic properties. And so the babies are massaged. There is this woman, there is, there is, there is a priest who actually decides when the baby needs to be breastfed. And so we realize here that at no other stages in the life cycle of a baby was there more division of labor. And all these communities had come together and they had very clearly differentiated, traditionally defined roles around the newborn. So we found further that it is the women who actually are the keepers of family health, they are the preservers of family health, and they are the internal gatekeepers. And the men, on the other hand, they were essentially responsible for the economic health of the family. They were the seekers of opportunities, and they were the external gatekeepers. When we looked at these norms and tried to build an explanatory model for it, we realized that every practice that the newborn baby was subjected to could be explained by two factors. One was the whole notion of pollution, and the second was their notion of evil eye and the evil spirit. So babies, when they are born for the first week, the mother and the baby, they are confined in this room, which is known as a sore, which is usually the room which is the farthest cold, dark, damp room, which is essentially a room that has been used as a storage. And that's where the mother delivers the baby and confined for the first week. Because they believe that most of the babies die in the first week because of an evil spirit known as Jamoga. And therefore, they fortify this so that this Jamoga does not actually enter and kill the baby. The second part is the whole notion of pollution. They actually believe that the mother is polluted and therefore she needs to be restricted from going out of these, of this, of this sore outside and pollute other people. Besides, these pollutant also attracts this evil spirit. And therefore, the woman is confined and she is not allowed outside the household. And so a combination of this whole notion of evil spirit on one hand that actually comes and kills the baby and this notion of pollution, a combination of these actually explains why mothers are confined for seven days with very limited access of health workers inside as well as them to seek care outside from the So we could see this as either uh, a challenge or we could find, or we could see this as an opportunity that we could translate that to our advantage. So, so we, we kind of looked at this and said, this is more like an inefficient system where majority of, it's like a thousand babies entering the system with 940, 940 essentially surviving at the end of it. And therefore, most of it would be explained by the practices that were there, family and community health practices. So this essentially set the stage for us to develop an intervention strategy for this. For example, we realized that these prevalent high-risk practices, they, they essentially could be so we, we essentially mapped it and said, how do we now develop an intervention that can be implemented at the community level and then experiment if it has actually leads to a reduction in mortality? So 
we map the prevalent high-risk practices against those targeted by medical risk factors. So for example, practices that were putting the babies at risk of hypothermia and infection were actually mapped against the biomedical risk factors of infection. And then we looked at behavioral interventions that could actually help mitigate that risk. And further, we said those risks then need to be behaviorally modified and then see if those changes in practices actually could lead to mortality reduction. So for us, the goal was to identify key high-risk practices in the community that were putting the baby at increased risk of infection or neonatal death, and then target them through behavioral modification and see if that led to a reduction. So, so we, we then developed a uh, we realized that here practices were important and people were important. And therefore, we, we essentially realized that here, newborn care practices were not just about the mother and the baby, but it was a whole community that, had, that were important stakeholders in this. The timing was extremely important. So just as the first slide helped us understand which were the practices that we wanted to pick up that we could help target to reduce neonatal mortality. The target groups were those on which the intervention could be targeted. And these were when the interventions could be targeted. So the timing of these visitations were very important. In, if you look at the normal coverage of health interventions in the country, less than 10% of them actually make a visitation on the first day. And we realized that it was extremely important that visitation had to be on day zero, day three, because that was the time that behaviors needed to be modified. So we planned two visits uh, in the antenatal period, one visit as soon as, as close as possible to the delivery, and then on day three of birth. We, now all of these had to be woven into an intervention that made sense to the community. Integrating all the epidemiological evidence and the formative research findings into an intervention that could make sense to the community was of paramount importance. So we had, we, when we realized that all the practices that babies were subjected to that, were, that put the baby at increased risk of infection were exactly the same that put the babies at increased risk of hypothermia. The difference between infection and hypothermia from a community perspective was they believed infection was caused by an evil spirit that they had no control over. For hypothermia, it was something that could be communicated to them. It was something that they could see for themselves through a thermometer, for example, or through perception, touch perception. We felt that if we were to target hypothermia, we would be able to shift the cause from evil spirit that was beyond their control to something that could be brought within their will of, of, uh, of what they could do for themselves. So for example, hypothermia was something that they could prevent. Hypothermia was something that they could manage. And therefore, instead of talking of the evil spirit or infection, we essentially brought in hypothermia and introduced skin-to-skin -skin care as a potential intervention to do so. From a behavior change management perspective, we position skin to skin as a super behavior. From a community perspective, it was important that we are able to introduce a practice that could actually pull other practices together. In other terms, it could serve as a gateway behavior and help communities and families uptake other behaviors. So we introduce skin to skin as an intervention 
which was primarily aimed at addressing the risk of hypothermia, something that was within their control. While they practiced that and put the baby on a skin to skin, and we they realized that when the babies root for the mother's breast, they should be allowed to breastfeed. And we use behavior change management strategies, a whole communication strategy to help make that move. So this is just a, a scheme of how the intervention uh, was delivered. And essentially, this entire intervention was packaged in the form of some key messages that resonated with their cultural sensitivity. So for example, they never planned for the baby's delivery or birth. And so even now, majority or almost universally, babies are not named before birth. In fact, they're named several weeks after birth because the risk of death is very high. And so here we train community health workers. And at that point in time in 2003, 2006, we did not have dedicated community health workers in the country to provide newborn health interventions. So we trained them and their goal, instead of just delivering messages, they were essentially, they went through a whole process of assessing the needs of the community, planning for some of those key interventions and its uptake, negotiate and transfer skills, and then support the family change their behavior. We'll give you an example of, of birth preparedness. There is a taboo around birth preparedness because they actually believe that it could actually jinx and increase the risk. And so we gave them examples from right within there is an agrarian society, majority of them are farmers. And you said, tell me two events in your life which you really plan. Said marriage of a daughter and, and agriculture. But so these are two very critical uh, events where they really plan. I said, why do you plan? We plan because any, we, we wanted to make sure that the outcome was predictable. We said, you actually plan. And we just need to extend that argument to say, we need to do the same thing for the baby. Or we could use another example of how do you wrap the baby and how do you wipe the baby and dry the baby. So when a mother is, goes to a pond, takes a shower, she comes out, and the first thing that she does is wipes herself, dries herself, and wraps herself in a sari and covers her head. Well, that's exactly what needs to be done to a baby. So we use these simple examples to develop what we call it as cognitive resonance that could resonate with their own reasoning and help them shift. We, of course, had a, this was a randomized, a cluster randomized control trial, and therefore I won't go into this, but just to give you some sense of, uh, of the different things that we did. This is just, this is a slide I deliberately put in because those communities, people actually don't know their age. And so when you are even, so those are from a global health research perspective, if you were to look at uh, age distribution in Norway, you'll actually find a very different figure that you would find here. So you will find that we have to work with communities to even help determine their age. And so, and, and so we, we put in a lot of systems so that we were able to rigorously evaluate this, this, this uh, hypothesis. And of course, these are all related to data integrity and data analysis. We looked at the coverage, so we were able to achieve the best of our ability no more than 70% of households were visited by a community health worker during the intervention. So twice in the antenatal period and twice during the neonatal period, in the early neonatal period. Although every family actually received uh, intervention because these were 
household-based interventions, but they also received community-based interventions, and they were group interventions. We looked at practices, and there were practices that changed very significantly. For example, breastfeeding within one hour went up dramatically from almost less than 20% to over 70%. The pre-lactate feeds that they used to give the baby came down. The skin-to-skin -skin care within 24 hours compared to the comparison was almost universal. Application of clay on the cord reduced. And there were other aspects that were essentially uh, related to warmth of the baby. So we found two practices that changed were broadly in the two major categories. One was around hygiene, and the other one was around uh, warmth of the baby. These were very simple practices that communities modified over the period of the study. And there were also practices that did not change much. We looked at the impact of this intervention over 18 months and we found a 54% reduction in neonatal mortality that we reported in the Lancet. More interestingly, actually, we had put in a surveillance system and we were also capturing vital statistics on maternal mortality and maternal health. Now, this intervention was primarily just aimed at the newborn and newborn care practices through individual-based intervention at the household level and community-based interventions. When we looked at the maternal health indicators and we looked at maternal mortality indicators, the, one of the challenges with maternal mortality is the numbers, you need big numbers to achieve significance. We actually found that mothers were taking advantage of these opportunities that were being created for newborn health to essentially seek care for themselves. So unlike the newborns, they were using these forums to essentially seek care for themselves and seek out care from trained health providers. So we found significant changes in maternal health practices and a, a shift and a direction towards, we haven't achieved significance, but we still continue to follow the population but we do see a shift, uh, a positive shift towards reduction in maternal mortality that should be in, published in the next couple of weeks in the International Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We, now this study essentially was, as we published these studies, there were at least a couple of other studies that, that were looking at this paradigm from Nepal and for Bangladesh and another in India. Oh. So, Unlike the established paradigm of biomedical interventions looking at neonatal mortality reduction, the, in the global health, we have been able, over a period of time, researchers have been able to, to generate evidence that actually suggests that very simple interventions that you could empower communities with, or in other words, Communities or families are not just part of the problem, they're actually part of the solution. They're not just consumers of health, but they're also producers of health. Prevention for them is far more cost effective and empowering than curative health, which in developing country settings with limited resources is hard to get by. And so there has been a major shift there within India and within the developing world wherein now the focus has shifted at least to begin with community-based interventions which simple practices it can have major impact in these in these regions with very low hanging fruits not to say that clinical intervention at the hospitals are not important they are part of the continuum of care that as we move and as systems get strengthened communities start seeking care from health facilities that would be something that would complement changes